So some of you might be wondering, why did you start reading in Exodus chapter 21? Right? You mentioned during announcements that you're going to be preaching on Mother's Day and, and mentioned how thankful we are for the mothers and the hard work that they do. Why in the world are we starting to read in Exodus chapter 21? We're reading about people being put to death. We're reading about all these different crimes and things. Well, there's a good reason for that. There's a reason why we're starting in Exodus chapter 21. Because our whole culture has just gone so far removed from right and wrong, good and evil, and just basically just mock at and have rejected the majority of God's laws. And to start off, I want to just, you know, and I don't think that even on Mother's Day, I don't think people are given enough honor and respect unto their mothers. And this is not just on Mother's Day, but every day. And I think just the, the whole, not just I think, what I see in our culture is this degrading of mothers and motherhood. And, you know, yeah, it's okay if you have one or two kids, but if you're a mom or a mother and you have, you know, five kids, ten kids, whatever, you're just, you know, you're a burden on society, you're crazy, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. Don't you know how to, what causes that? Don't you know how to stop that? This is the mindset that the culture has today. And instead of going, wow, you have a really difficult job and, and good for you and you're really blessed and, and you know, you've got a lot of hard work to do, it's, oh, well, why don't you stop having those kids? You know, it's just this negative attitude and this negative mindset. And I'm going to go back and forth a little bit, just kind of touching on how modern society views women and mothers versus what the Bible teaches about mothers and about women and about godly women. And we're going to look at some passages this morning. We started off in Exodus 21, first and foremost, just to underscore the respect or honor that God puts on Mothers and fathers, if you look down to verse number 15, the Bible says, And he that smiteth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. That is a very grave commandment. What does it mean to smite? It means to hit, right? The level of disrespect for a child and we're not talking about a two-year-old, right? We're not talking about the one-year-old, the two-year-old that, that gets angry and, you know, and they, they, they want to punch dad or whatever because they're, because they're little. That's not what Scripture is talking about. It would be ridiculous to think that that's what the Bible is talking about. Uh, we can see in other contexts that that's, that's not the case. This is talking about a grown child, a, an, an adult or, a grown, you know, someone, someone who's who's grown up that actually hit and you know what it happens tell me it doesn't happen you see the domestic disputes or whatever that you know th th they come up where a son you know this rebel it's, and it's always these rebellious punk kids that are out doing drugs getting drunk and everything else and mouthing off to their parents and you know they think they're so tough or whatever you're not gonna tell me what to do and they end up slugging their one of their parents well, what the Bible says, uh, any, any child that does that, you're going to be put to death. Like, you're going to die for that. That's a very serious commandment. And you know what? The law of the Lord is perfect, the Bible says, converting the soul. Amen, that's right. And you can say, well, that's extreme. All, all, I did, all he did was, you know, slap his mom in the face. What do you mean, all he did? That's huge. That's a, that's a big deal. The, the mother that gave birth to you, the mother that raised you, to go ahead and, and think that you can strike your mother or your father and think it's not that big of a deal. Well, God says, you know what? That is a very big deal, and that deserves your life. And not even just hitting. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says, And he that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. So God, in his wisdom, decided that it's not even just hitting, physically hitting your, your mother or your father. He says, you, you put a curse on your mother or father. 
What's a curse? A curse would be something like go to hell, right? If you want someone to be blessed, you tell them you want good things to happen to them, good things to come their way. A curse is you're wishing bad things upon somebody. That would, that's a curse. It's not, you know, a lot of people think you hear the word curse and you might think of like a witch, like casting a spell on somebody. Yeah, that could be considered a curse because they, they're, she's trying to get evil, you know, they're trying to get evil on somebody. But it's more than just that. That's not, that's not what the Bible's on. When you curse somebody, you're, you're just wanting harm on them, wishing harm on them and, and telling them that. According to Scripture, that deserves a death penalty. And the reason why so many people would think that's insane is because you've gone so far away from the Word of God and what's right and what's wrong and the level of respect that ought to be given to parents. And, the, and you know, we're living in a society where kids are losing respect not only for adults but just for their own parents. The way that, the way that you hear children speaking to their parents is ridiculous these days. I think there ought to be a very, very uh, strict structure set up in the household so that, parent, so that children understand within their own household who mom and dad are in relation to them. And because why? Because you never want this to come up. And no parent's going to want their child to be put to death. And no parent's going to want their child to be hitting them or cursing them either. The children need to be taught the respect from a young age. That they need to respect their, their mother. They need to respect their father. And that's part of the parent's job is to do that. But people have gotten so relaxed with everything. This is only going to abound more the, the, the spoiled brat attitude with these kids that, that think they deserve everything and that they're going to curse or hit their parents when, when things don't go their way or whatever. Or when you say something to offend them. That's, that's not the way it works. It's funny, we've been dealing with my three-year-old and like I said, this not, that's not what this is talking about. But you know how kids, they always pick up on things that, that people say at the home. So. One of the things he's been saying lately is, I said I wanted this, or I said that you need to do this. Well, he's picking that up for me, because I'm the one that says, hey, look, I said you need to go to bed. I said, you know, so he's, he's picking that up along those ways. But see, they get taught, and he needs to be taught. Like, you're not the boss. Okay, you're the child. Now, look, it's cute when they're three. It's not so cute when they're 12, 15, 20. Talking to their parents disrespectfully and saying, no, I said you're going to do, you know. We need to get our minds back into the Bible and what God says about how we ought to be honoring and respecting our parents, and today specifically we're talking about mothers. You know, one of the Ten Commandments, the Bible says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And I, I'm not going to go into the details this morning, but honor is more than just respect. Honor is, is going to be taking care of and providing for. This commandment, I think, has a lot more to do with taking care of your parents when they become old than it does with you know, little children obeying their parents when they're younger. They're both applicable. But I think specifically that this has much more to do with the just take, you know, taking care of and providing for and not just leaving your parents, you know, as they get old and they need help and their health starts to fail, that you just go, here you go, the state can deal with you or just leave you off to, to go die in a home somewhere. No, you need to take care of your parents. Show some love and respect and, and care for your parents. That's your job. And you know what? This is a job that the Bible doesn't put a, a qualifier on there. Like, we'll only take care of them if they're saved. 
doesn't say that. You, if, if your parents, if you, you were born of a mother and a father, and if your parents need help, then you need to be able to help them. Right. That's right. You need to do it. That's, right. That's incumbent upon you. It's part of God's commands. <coughs> the Bible says in Deuteronomy 27, 16, turn to Proverbs chapter 30. Deuteronomy 27, 16 says, Cursed be he that setteth light by his father or his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. This is a cursing from God. He says, if you set light. So basically, setting light by is just kind of blowing off and not really treating it that seriously at all and just, just making light of your parents and what they say. If you set light by your mother and father, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever, and just blow them off. The Bible says, cursed be he that setteth light by his father or his mother. It ought, it's a relationship that ought to be taken seriously. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this, but, you know, one of the reasons, I think one of the greatest reasons is also this demonstrates, you know, we, we are in, as believers, in a father-son or father-daughter relationship with God. As a born-again believer, you are a child, and, you know, a lot of things that, that God has instituted in this world are reflections of greater truths, Oftentimes that have to do with God. So marriage itself, the Bible talks about, we went over this last week in Ephesians chapter 5, you know, relates God's relationship with the church and Jesus' relationship with the church in addition to husbands and wives. Well, with mothers and fathers, you know, we need to honor our Father in heaven and treat that very, very seriously and not just blow off and just not be disrespectful and not setteth light by and definitely not cursing our father and things like that. Those are all wicked things. And uh, God expects this, a similar type of relationship here on earth with your physical parents. Proverbs chapter 30, we've got some characteristics here of the generation <coughs> that simply doesn't respect their parents. And just as we read through this, look at how many of these are starting to become more and more common in our, com in our culture today. We're going to start reading in verse number 11 of Proverbs chapter number 30. The Bible reads, There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. And in these next few verses, we're going to keep on seeing there is a generation, there's a generation. I think these are all the same generation. It's all about the same generation. There's a generation that curses their father they don't bless their mother. They don't appreciate what's been given to them. They don't appreciate the hard work. They don't appreciate the love and all that's been done for them. Just no appreciation at all. Completely disregarding what they've done. They don't bless their mother. They curse their father. Verse 12. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. So the same generation that curses their parents, they don't care what they have to do. They think they're all righteous. They're lifted up. They look at themselves going, well, I'm such a good person. But they're not. I mean, the Bible says they're not, they're not washed from their filthiness. They're filthy. But they think they're not. They think they're great. Verse number 13, there's a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. So they're full of pride. They are haughty. That's why, I mean, anyone who's thinking that highly of themselves already is someone who's going to be really lifted up and thinking they're all that and I, I'm pure, I'm clean, I'm righteous. Verse 14, there's a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. And this just shows the total lack of love and compassion and uh, charity towards other people and just you know their teeth are as swords they don't care about other people it goes hand in hand with not caring about your parents i mean if you can't even love and respect your parents then who are you going to love and respect and this is all part of that same generation and i think we're only going to see you know the bible says that um in the latter days, when, when sin's abounding, that the, the love of many is going to wax cold. Just because of all of the wickedness and all, and all of the sin that's going to be running rampant. As people just get further and further away from God, they think they're right in their own eyes. 
but their, their love is going to wax cold, which then that verse 14 that we just read there starts to come to pass. So as I mentioned before, you know, the philosophy of this world today has no respect for mothers. And I'm going to briefly touch on some of this stuff that I, I hit on last week, but you know, women are told to go to work and to get a job that a man would normally get, and then you'll be respected, right? right? This is the way the feminist movement wants women to think is that there's no honor, there's no respect in staying at home and raising children in the house. They put zero value on that. They think, oh, you want to be somebody, you need to go off to work, you need to go off to a job. Don't work for your husband. Don't talk, you know, don't respect your husband and say, yes, sir. If you want to have respect, you need to go off to a job and work for a man and say, yes, sir. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But they're going to, you know, this, this is the mindset. This is the same culture that's going to call babies mistakes. No value on human life. And then when you have a mistake, you kill that mistake. How perverted. I mean, that's just, that, that is reprehensible and disgusting, yet it's, it's, it's accepted so much today by so many people. Accepted, promoted, endorsed. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, she's just a teenager. She can't have a child. Oh, but they haven't even gone to college yet. They haven't finished high school yet. Yeah. So let's just kill somebody then, right? right? Someone sinned and did something they shouldn't have done, so now let's just murder the, the child that's a result of that. How about no? Turn to Psalm 127. I mean, this is so anti-Scripture and anti-God and anti-Christ to have that type of a mindset. I'm not going to get in. This isn't going to be an abortion sermon, but it's, it's, it's insane you know, be careful where you get your, your philosophies from and who influences you. Because I don't know about you, but I dead sure don't want somebody who has a mindset of saying you can kill a child, no matter how old it is, giving me any type of advice. I don't want to hear from someone that's that wicked, that can't understand what human life is and the value of human life. When the value is that low on human life, it's, it's really no surprise that their value is that low of, of women. Because as we're going to already have seen and we're going to continue to see, God puts a high value on mothers, on motherhood, on women. Yes, Christians, Christianity in the Bible, God places high value on women. The feminists will tell you, no, 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 you, you treat women as second-class citizens. No, we don't. The Bible teaches honor. The Bible teaches respect. The Bible teaches love. Just different jobs. Husbands have a job to do. I have a job. I need to provide. I need to work with my hands. I need to work and sweat and toil and provide for my family. Right. And there's honor in that. And there should be. And there should be respect for that. But women have a job too. Mm -hmm. Wives have a job. Caring for the home. Right. Keeping everything in order at home. Raising children. Rearing children. Making sure everything's in order. Look, that is an important job too. It's actually, I think, even more important. Yeah. Whatever I go out and do to earn money, I don't care about that. Like that, the, the, the actual value or importance of whatever it is that I'm building or doing or selling or, you know, compared to my, the lives of my family and my children and how they turn out when they're older. I mean, yeah, in the short term, I'm getting some money to provide for my family. My wife is molding and forming and fashioning their minds as they continue to grow up. That is what's really going to instill who they become when they become older. 
that time investment that mom spends at home with the kids is more valuable to me than just about anything else. Because the love that you have for your family should exceed the love you have basically for anyone else. I mean, it just makes sense. I love my wife, which is one of the reasons why I go out and I provide for everyone. And I love my kids and I do that, but I can't do everything. No one person can do everything. You have to give something up. If you're going to provide the food and everything else, then you can't be there all the time to do all the rearing and raising. It doesn't work that way. But because there's such a high value on the children and how they're raised, this is why it's critical to have a mom that can be at home with the kids and not to give that job away to someone else because you feel like you need to have more money. If, if your needs aren't being met, then dad needs to work harder. But you also have to recognize what are needs and what are wants. Again, going back to the culture today, well, I need to have my smartphone. I mean, oh, you expect me not to have internet and cable TV and two cars? What are you talking about? Those aren't needs. But when people need to have those things, they say, well, we all, both mom and dad now need to go off to work because uh, how are we going to live? I'll tell you how you're going to live. You're going to live much better and happier regardless of the actual amount of income. And people, oh yeah, it's easy for you to say you have so much money. No, seriously. When you, when you consider what's important in your life, Yes, there's a certain amount of, of luxury or, or uh, you know, having a little bit more money can help uh, relieve some stress in certain areas, for sure. I'm not going to say that that's not true. But when you can place your priorities right and have that value, I'll tell you this, I would never trade never trade the extra little bit of cash to put my children off in somebody else's care to then allow for eight hours a day, six hours a day, 10 hours a day, however much it is for them to be receiving all of their instruction from somebody else, from someone other than mom or other than dad. Not going to happen. I think that's worth the, the financial sacrifice. And yeah, there's a lot of reasons why uh, it, may, it may be harder today for, for families to get by on one income. I understand that, but I think it's still worth the sacrifice. And I, I know this much that when we get done reading this, you're going to see the value that God puts on this. And when God gives the assignment for women to be raising their children, when you do right by God, he will meet your needs. He's not going to give you, he doesn't promise to give you, let's put it that way. He doesn't promise to give you all of the wants and desires and all the things in this world that you could set your heart upon. He doesn't promise to give you any of that. Now he may, but he doesn't promise that to you. But he does promise to meet your needs. Which means you're going to be clothed, you're going to be fed, which ultimately is what you need in this world. Because everything else is just going to go away anyways. I mean, your food, you need to sustain to do what's really important. Everything else is going to be gone. I had you turn to Psalm 127. Look at verse number three. The Bible reads, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Where I say, this world's going to call having babies a mistake. Oh, Oh, you're, you're having another one. Oh, did, you know, what happened? Like you did something wrong. You forgot something. You, you, for, you forgot to prevent that. Well, no, actually, I believe the Bible, and I think my child's a reward. The fruit of the womb. 
What is produced out of a mother's womb is a child. That's a reward from God. That's a blessing. That is a great thing to have. The Bible says in verse number four, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. The, the counsel today to younger people getting married is, oh, no, no, don't have any kids yet. Go, go do this and go do that and see the world and have this fun and get, or get a job established, get all these things lined up, and then start having kids. Well, the Bible says, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Have kids when you're young. When you're married, don't, don't, decide to not have kids at all for any reason. You don't need to postpone it for anything. Start having a, start having a normal relationship with your, with your spouse. And you know what happens as a result? The fruit of the womb. The Bible says in verse number five, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. I don't know how many times you have people saying, I don't know how you can manage that. You know what? I'm actually really happy. With the children I have, I'm happy. I'm not stressed out. I'm not going, oh, another child. My wife's pregnant again. Man, what? I wish this would just stop. No. No, I don't. They're a blessing. But you know when they're a blessing? Is when you are following God's way of raising them. When you don't just leave them to their own, to their own devices and, and allow them to just grow up to become the children that are going to be cursing and smiting their parents and expecting everything and demanding everything and show no respect to their parents. Yeah, I wouldn't want to have a bunch of those, but I don't have a bunch of those, which is why they're a blessing. Happy as a man has his quiver. I want my quiver of children. I want them full. And whatever God decides to give me is, is I'm going to be super happy with that. This is the mindset that the Bible puts on having children. Flip back, if you would, to Genesis chapter number three. I don't think any woman should ever be ashamed or embarrassed or afraid of having their identity wrapped up in motherhood. Too often today, people, you know, the women are being taught, girls are being taught to have this career, become the CEO, get involved in all this research and do these other, you know, just, just doing all of this stuff outside of the home and outside of, of raising children and getting their minds set on doing all this other stuff. When Adam and Eve were first created, right? Adam created, Ad, or Adam. God created Adam. God created the man. And he called his name Adam. And then God decided to make a help meet for Adam. A helper. Someone to help him along, to be with him. He says, it's not good for the man to be alone. He wants him to, to have a companion with him for life. And he made Eve, and uh, well, he made the woman, out of man, pulled a rib out of Adam, made the woman. And then it says in verse number 20 of Genesis chapter 3, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So the name, her identity, the name of Eve, the name that he gave her, why does she have that name? Why is she called by that? Every time he calls her name, there's a meaning behind it. And that meaning is she's the mother of all living. Do you think that was a derogatory slap in the face that Adam's trying to give to his, his new wife, the only other woman on the whole world, trying to just put her down a little bit, say, well, I'm going to call you a mother, as if that's a bad thing? No, of course not. This was a good thing. This was, this was very respectable and very honorable for him to give her a name of Eve it would, that had a meaning of being the mother of all living. Everybody that's going to be born on this planet, you're the mother. You're that progenitor. That is, that is a very honorable thing. That is very respectable. But her identity is wrapped up in being the mother. 
of all living. That's not a bad thing. In fact, it's, a very, it's, 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 a, it's quite the honor. It's not just not a bad thing, it's a really good thing. Having children is a blessing and an honor in itself. Flip over to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. I think today's world wants to degrade mothers in motherhood. The Bible exalts motherhood. Genesis 17, verse number 15, the Bible says, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name, shall her name be, and I will bless her. So God says, I'm going to bless Sarah. I'm changing her name, just like Abram's name was changed to Abraham. And you go through the Bible, names always have meaning, right? And um, it has to do with the person. So he's changing Sarai's name to Sarah. And he says, I'm going to bless her. God's blessing Sarah. What's he going to do to bless her? And give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. I'm going to bless her, and the way I'm going to bless her is she's going to be a mother. Being a mother is a blessing from God. There's nothing to be ashamed of receiving a blessing from God. Being a mother is a great thing. It, it, it should be exalted and, and everybody should recognize, hey, good job being a mom. And, and that's why I love that there's a day Mother's Day. I don't, I'm not afraid. It's obviously, it's not like some scripture ordained holiday that you have to observe. It's just a secular holiday, but I think it's great. We should take some time at least once a year to say good job to the mothers. To say, we, we give honor and respect unto the moms that are doing a hard job in recognizing that and lifting that up, exalting that. Sarah's blessed here with being a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Genesis 24, 60 says, turn if you would to Proverbs 31. It's the last place I'll have you turn. Genesis 24, 60 says, and they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions. And they let, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. I'm pretty sure this is the, the biggest number recorded in Scripture. Thousands of millions. Just billions. As Rebecca's leaving her house, remember when, when um, Abraham's servant went to find a wife for Isaac? And he comes upon Rebecca and, you know, and, and he tells him the whole story and she decides to go with him and to go and be Isaac's wife. This is the blessing that as, as Rebecca is departing from her family and they're trying to, to wish her the best in her new life and where she's going to be, what they considered to be the best blessing they can give her was be the mother of thousands of millions. We want you to be so blessed. We want you to be a mom. We want you to be a mom of billions of people. <laughs> Obviously, it's talking about, you know, generations to come, but having that large family, having more people, you know, building a large name, a large family, there is a value to that. All throughout Scripture, having a lot of kids, being a mom to those kids. Why? Because... You're raising, you're teaching them. I think this is one of the reasons why when you read through the books of, you know, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Kings, and you, and you read through about all these different kings, you oftentimes see who the mother was. You know, because you know that for the most part, except for when there's, there's changes um, in, in, the, in the kingdom of Israel, because you have different lineages kind of taking power, they'll have their children then for a while, will succeed them in the throne until some other coup comes or someone else, you know, takes over. But in, um, in Judah, it was all the lineage of the household of David, right? So they're all related. But you'll notice that uh, the Bible will oftentimes say, well, who's the mother? And sometimes the children do evil and sometimes the children do good. And I think one of the reasons why the Bible mentions the mother 
is because of the amount of influence that mom has had with the child. So when you see a king and they do right in the sight of the Lord and then it mentions their mother's name, I think that's giving honor and credit unto that mom for raising their child right. Because you think about some of these kings, and especially in the, in the, in the house of Judah and in, in David's lineage, you know, the amount of wives that they had was a lot. They had a lot of wives and a lot of kids. And that wasn't right. And the Bible says that the king's not supposed to multiply wives. I mean, it's written in black and white, and they're not supposed to have done it, but they did it anyways. So if you have a dad that has lots of wives, all kinds of kids, because he has so many wives, there's no way that he's spending as much time as he ought to spend with, with each individual child and why, you know, there's no way he's going to have that great of a relationship, which puts that much more burden on the mom to make sure, hey, this child's going to be raised up right. This child's going to be raised up the right way. And I mean, even just the way that, that God has designed it with, with men being off working, you know, you're still limited as a dad with how much time you get with your children and, and influence and everything else. Now, you ought to be there every night or, as, you know, as much as you can. Obviously, some people travel a little bit for their work or whatever, but, um, and that's necessary sometimes. But mom ultimately is the one that's put in this position to, to be responsible for the upbringing of their children. And... Like I said, there's so much more value in impacting the life of your family and souls and how people turn out versus a corporation getting more money. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, the corporation I work for, I'm going to do my best to try to make them profitable and, and that they can, they can earn money and stuff. But, but what value does that really hold? Yeah. Compared to souls, compared to, to my children's lives and, and how the rest of their life is going to be. That's mom's job to ensure, ensure how well they do. And moms, don't get, don't get worn out. And don't forget the importance of your job. It's easy to, I'm sure, Dealing with all the screaming and craziness and, and work that's going on around the house. And, and you know, I, I, I know firsthand with, you know, hearing, especially from ladies have kids, you know, I just want to have a conversation with an adult sometime. Because <laughs> there's so, so much working with the little ones and just not, not having the same level of conversation. I get it, but hang in there. And never forget how important your job really is. Don't forget how important your children are and every little thing. You might not think it's that important on a day-to-day -day basis or whatever, uh, but, it, but it really is. It all accumulates and it's something that happens over time. It's harder to see on the individual level on a day-to-day -day basis, but over time it's huge. It's huge. Don't ever underestimate the importance of the job of a mother. But the, but the world will say, oh, does your wife work or is she just a housewife? Those are the comments that the world makes. That's a foolish, foolish thing to say. Just a housewife, huh? Does she work? Yeah, no, no. You know, but with my five kids, you know, at home, my wife doesn't work at all. Yeah, right. No, my wife is actually a great mom. Stupid questions imply that just because my wife doesn't go off and work for some other man, she's not working. That's ridiculous. She actually has a, a much hard, I think, a harder job than I do. Whenever I'm alone with all the kids, oh, man. I struggle to get through the day sometimes. I like... Wait, we got to make food. Oh, wait, you got a diaper. We got, you know, like. 
I can't, I can't deal with it. My mind doesn't work the same way. As, you know, women in general, I think, are easier at multitasking. You got like all different things going on. They could be talking on the phone, holding a baby, making food, do, you know. And I'm just like, okay, wait, let me think. All right, I'm making food right now. Wait, wait, don't bother me. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta focus on this food. Can't get it all done. Thank God my wife doesn't get sick very often and require me to actually make sure that everything's being done right around the house because that is not an easy job to do. But every time, it's, it's a good thing when she does because it, it always brings into perspective for me the amount of work that's actually being done. Because as a dad, as a husband, it's easy to find the things that aren't done, right? Why isn't this done? Why isn't that done? Until you walk in those shoes for <laughs> okay, well, you, you end up showing a little bit more grace, a little bit more mercy. I could kind of see why not all of this stuff is be done, especially if you hear about some of the events that happen from time to time. But um, thanks, moms. Thanks for all the work. Proverbs thirty-one. We're going to close with this. We know what the, the world's attitude is, but this is, this is God's attitude towards women and what a godly woman should be like and should do. And you'll see from Scripture that, you know, godly women aren't lazy. They do a lot of work. And this is how, this is how a mom, a housewife ought to be. This is, this is the, you know, someone of high value in scripture and you'll notice that there's a lot of things being done here and there's a lot of things that br can bring honor unto women great things you just have to have your values right these things mean way more than some badge of ceo way more who cares But I built this great company from the ground up. Well, good for you. My wife's building children from the ground up Amen. to be great people. Amen. They're going to have an impact in this world, an impact on other people's lives. Right. And, and do a lot to serve the Lord, God willing. I mean, that's Proverbs 31. We're going to start reading in verse number 13. We're not going to read the entire passage, but... Um, just to get an idea of all these attributes and all these things that a godly woman does. The Bible says, She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. There's a lot of work to be done at home. So this is someone getting materials to actually make clothing and make things from scratch at home. She's like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. This is the work that goes into working on a budget and getting good deals and getting good value. That's why it says she's like the merchant ships. What do merchant ships do? They make money by going off. They make the investment. They go off to a far place because they could find goods and resources a lot cheaper and then they could bring it back and make a profit on it, right? right? So a, a godly wife, a godly woman is going to be able to go off and find the, the, the best values, the best deals for the goods that the house requires whether it be the food or resource or whatever it is that you need at home, she's like those merchant ships. She's going to go out and find the best place to make the most use of the resources that the family has. She's able to, to, to manage that and be in charge of that. Verse 15, She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. Again, this is the Bible describing a godly woman that's getting up early. You talk about not work. Oh, she only stays at home. She's a housewife. Well, if she's a, a, a housewife like this, you can't say she's not working. She's getting up before, before dawn just to make sure everyone else is cared for. Making sure that you're going to have a good day. You're going to have a good day. These kids, you know, everyone's going to be set for the day. Getting up early. It says, um, she considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands, she planted the vineyard. So she's doing work to provide more food. Whatever she can do at home with her own hands in a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. So those, uh, you know, the, the, the picture of the, you know, the woman you know, flexing her muscle. Women are, women are it's, a, it's a good quality to be strong. But that doesn't mean going off to the factory. 
to, to be on an assembly line or whatever. Whatever that picture was supposed to be representative of. We can do it. Whatever, whatever the slogan was. Verse 18, she perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night. So not only is she getting up early before it's still night, her candle doesn't go out on us. So she's not just going straight to bed like early. She's, she's staying up and making sure everything's getting done and needs to get done in the day. Verse 19, she layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings with tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. The godly woman, the godly wife, the godly mother is not just sitting around idle. She's busy. She's working. She's doing stuff. She's providing for the house, making sure they're clothed, making sure they're fed, making sure this stuff is all being done and staying up as long as it needs to be getting up and staying up. That's a hard job. It's a really difficult job being performed here. And this woman's doing so much. She's actually saying, well, as long as I'm making clothing, I've got enough resources here because I've done a good enough job of, of finding the right materials. I can make some extra and deliver it to someone else for them to sell it and then get a profit that way and just bring in a little bit extra. But it's all done while she's getting all of her jobs done at home. And she's able to just maximize the time and the resources and everything that she has because she's just doing that good of a job. The Bible says in verse 28, her children arise up and call her blessed. See the mom, the wife that's doing this. You're not going to have those kids that are cursing you and that are smiting you. I don't know what happened. You weren't doing this. I don't know what you were doing, but you weren't doing this. The kids will naturally respect the mom that's doing all these things because you could, just, I mean, you just can see that. Last week I was talking about the, the marriages, husbands and wives. You know, the husband's going to be, it's not going to be that hard to love your wife when you see how, how much she is working and doing all this, this stuff at home. That makes it really easy to love your wife. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Now look, I'll admit, this Proverbs 31, there's a lot of things being done there. This is a high standard. But it, it shows a woman that stays busy, that's working real hard, and that takes her job seriously. And it is an important job. It's so important. The, the, the job of motherhood, it's not easy. It's definitely hard. We need to have respect for it. Kids need to respect their parents. Kids need to respect how much their mom and their dad are doing for them. And we ought never to look down on someone who's just a mother or just a housewife. Because there is a lot involved with that. And women, you know, you just need to, to try to do your best to line up with what the Bible's saying there. Don't be the lazy, you know, bring a bad name on motherhood by being the, the mom that's eating bonbons on the sofa and letting your kids run off and doing whatever and not working. Because that is a shame. Because you have a hard job. That's just as shameful as a man that goes off to work and he's just playing on his phone all day and not actually working. And not doing anything. Being a mom is a job. <laughs> it's an important job. You're, you're, not, you're not marrying someone to just say, oh, I get to stay home and do nothing all day. 
That's not the way it works. We love you, moms. Keep doing a good job. Let's always have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for everything about your creation, Lord, for creating us as men and women and giving us the jobs you've given us, Lord, and blessing us with children. God, it, it truly is a blessing. We thank you so much for, for all the children in our lives. And I pray that you would please just bless our church, bless the women here, bless the moms. And I pray that you would please just help us to get, regardless of what this wicked world says, help us to have a right mind within us and a right spirit within us that is in line with your words and, and that we would have value on the things that you put value on and the things that are truly important in this life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.